Hello, everybody. I was, uh, I'm very happy to be here today, and I was very disappointed not to be here for the first two lectures. On Tuesday, I was teaching, and on Wednesday, in testimony to our event saturation at Yale, I was hosting a different lecture. But I'm delighted to be here today. I have known Roger since he first came to Yale in 1980, I believe, at which time he was a starting assistant professor and I was a truly obnoxious graduate student who wouldn't listen to anyone and was convinced I knew everything. And uh, he nonetheless gave me uh, large amounts of very good advice, uh, which I think I'd have done better if I'd taken more of it sooner. In particular, he kept telling me it was fine for me to think everybody in the world is wrong and, and point that out in four-point harmony, but it, the time would come when I would actually have to make some arguments of my own. And he, he, um, uh, he was right about that, and he also exhibited the trait that is uh, the, one of the many impressive things about him, which was that he always thought his job was not to tell you what to do or to uh, make you be a duckling but to uh, get he, to do his best to help other people make the arguments they want to make as well as possible. And so this is one of my uh, enduring disagreements with him. He thinks that he's a Lockean liberal, but in fact he's an Aristotelian because he understands that people are um, plastic and pliable and uh, need to develop to become the, the, the selves that they can be. And not only does he believe that, he acts on it, uh, and, and anyone who's had him on a dissertation committee will know that that is how he, he works with graduate students. It's also how he works with, with, with undergraduates and with colleagues, and so he's, he's a, a truly terrific, uh, I've known him as a, as a professor and then as a colleague, in, in, and I can, I can tell you that he's one of the people that causes you to change what you write, uh, as opposed to just hit you over the head with what he thinks or uh, say things that you'll end up ignoring. So he's, he really adds value to the people that he works with. And I think that that's, uh, that is his central trait. So these Castle lectures that he's delivering are right on the subject that uh, informs them the mission of the Castle Lectures, which is, is to speak to um, issues that are um, uh, of great ethical importance in a complex modern society. And I'm sure you heard at earlier lectures about the dedication of the, the Castle Lecture series, so I won't repeat that. Um, the general title of these lectures, that's not who we are, Populism and Stories of Peoplehood. Um, is a subject I know that has been dear to his heart uh, for a considerable time and has informed quite a lot of his recent writings. And today he's going to be giving a lecture called Who Are We Americans Now? He's going to be talking about the uh, story of peoplehood being pressed by President Trump and canvassing some alternatives that might more profitably be impressed than that. So, Rogers, welcome back. Thank you very much, Ian. I have uh, benefited enormously from my uh, discussions with many colleagues here uh, over the years, and none more so than Ian, even though uh, they have often been matters of disagreement uh, that have changed my own thinking. And now I expect I'll give a lecture with which he'll disagree today. So <laughs> my uh, title for this lecture, let's see, uh, is Who Are We Americans Now? And it references Who Are We? The Challenges to America's National Identity, the last book by the late, highly accomplished, but highly controversial political scientist Samuel P. Huntington. In 2017, Carlos Lozada, book critic for the Washington Post, wrote that Huntington was a prophet for our time because his vision, especially as expressed in this book, is partially reflected in Donald Trump's message and appeal, even though, Lozada said, Huntington might be apprehensive about Trump's personal traits. In Who Are We?, Huntington not only departed from 
he subtly mocked his own earlier view that American identity rests strictly on embrace of the liberal democratic principles of the American creed. He cited with approval one of his critics, Roger Smith, who said this view is at best a half-truth. The other half, Huntington now contended, was that American identity has a cultural core, an Anglo-Protestant culture that he portrayed as threatened today by Mexican immigration and militant Islam. The similarities of Huntington's arguments to statements of Donald Trump who began his presidential campaign by warning against the dangers of Mexican immigration and later called for a ban on Islamic immigrants are clear. Those two positions define Trump as an anti-immigrant populist similar to many other right-wing populist leaders around the world today. For those of us who believe that America has benefited enormously from immigration, including modern Mexican and Muslim immigrants, and who also believe that the U.S. has deeply entrenched traditions of racial and religious as well as gender bigotry that must always be firmly combated, these positions and others that President Trump has taken are anathema. Yet it is undeniable that they have helped Trump rise to heights few thought possible. Although most leaders of both parties not only opposed but openly ridiculed Trump early in 2016, he defied expectations in part because he told a story of American peoplehood that resonated deeply with enough ordinary Americans to enable him to win the Republican nomination easily and the Electoral College vote narrowly. In his inaugural address, President Trump gave his story a name similar to the one adopted in the winning 2014 manifesto of India's Hindu nationalist BJP that I discussed yesterday. Trump promised, from this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. Now, I've been arguing that in many political contexts today, it's both possible <clears throat> and necessary to combat narrow, repressive stories of peoplehood with more inclusive, egalitarian ones. Is it necessary to advance such stories in America today? And if so, can better stories be found? My answer, unsurprisingly, is yes to both. To make that case, I will first consider President Trump's America First vision more fully, and then turn to some alternative accounts of American peoplehood that might constructively compete with it. I will explain why I regard one of these stories, portraying America as devoted to carrying forth the Declaration of Independence project of securing rights for all people of all colors everywhere, as on balance, the best American story. My goal, however, is not to persuade everyone to accept it. Instead, my hope is to encourage others to put forth a variety of distinct, though overlapping, good stories of American peoplehood, enriching democratic discussions that should ultimately decide who we are as Americans now. President Trump's inaugural address fit perfectly with modern scholarship's minimalist definition of populism as a, quote, ideology that posits a struggle between the will of the common people and a conspiring elite. Trump narrated America's past as one in which, quote, a small group in our nation's capital has reaped the rewards of government while the people have borne the cost. Too many of our citizens have experienced American carnage, he said. But he announced, January 20th, 2017 will be remembered as the day the people became the rulers of this nation again. He promised a future in which every decision on trade, on taxes, on immigration, on foreign affairs will be made to benefit American workers and American families. New initiatives would bring back our jobs, bring back our borders, bring back our wealth with, quote, new roads and highways and bridges and airports and tunnels and railways, getting people off welfare and back to work and make America great again. The president said his America First vision rested on the conviction that, quote, a nation exists to serve its citizens. It is the right of all nations to put their own nation first. He maintained that Americans do not seek to impose our way of life on anyone, but rather to let it shine as an example for everyone to follow. He also contended that his vision encompasses all the citizens of America, 
Americans, he said, form one nation, sharing one heart, one home, and one glorious destiny with no room for prejudice, but rather an awareness that whether we are black or brown or white, we all bleed the same red blood of patriots. Then, in a manner that many proponents of diversity found ominous, Trump asserted, the bedrock of our politics will be a total allegiance to the United States of America. And through our loyalty to our country, we will rediscover our loyalty to each other. In terms of the three criteria for good stories of people I outlined yesterday, the three R's of resonance, respect, and reticulation, Trump's America First narrative certainly resonated with economic, cultural, and political concerns and deeply valued identities of many millions of Americans. He also sought to convey respect for all American citizens as well as other nations. His vision of America appeared, however, to leave little, if any, room for what I called reticulation, for the greatest feasible recognition and accommodation of the many diverse communities, cultures, and ways of life that comprise modern America. His rhetoric raised reasonable worries that in a pluralistic society, demands for total allegiance might lead to totalitarian consequences. Before and since his inauguration, Trump's tweets, speeches, and most importantly, his policies have provided abundant evidence of his hostility to many forms of diversity. Prior to his pursuit of the presidency, Trump repeated, Trump's repeated challenges to Barack Obama's citizenship already suggested that he found something un-American about an African-American president. During the campaign, he contended an American-born judge of Mexican descent could not apply the law fairly, and he disparaged the lives of black and brown Americans, grossly overstating criminal statistics for blacks and immigrants. At a May 2016 rally, Trump reportedly made the revealing remark, the only important thing is the unification of the people because the other people don't mean anything. Whatever the truth about Trump's personal racial views may be, moreover, his promises to make America great again clearly spoke most powerfully to those who looked back favorably on an older, predominantly white Christian male-governed nation. Analysts of his electoral support overwhelmingly concur that Americans who believed the U.S. should be a predominantly European-descended Christian nation saw Trump as their candidate. John Sides, writing as part of the Democracy Fund Voter Study Group, found that in the summer of 2016, 30% of Trump supporters thought it was important for Americans to be of European ancestry, 72% thought Americans should be born in the United States, and 63% thought being Christian was fairly or very important to being American. These figures were all much higher than those for any other candidate. They led Lynn Vavrick to conclude Mr. Trump's focus on ethnicity, religion, and American identity was the catalyst that united a relatively small set of Republican primary voters behind him and helped him defy expectations and become the GOP nominee. In office, Trump's comments suggesting that there were good people among the white supremacist protesters at Charlottesville, derogating African countries and Haitian immigrants, criticizing African-American athletes and celebrities protesting against police violence against people of color, and many more, have continued to appeal to those with strong senses of white identity while alienating other Americans. Moreover, Trump and his appointees have done much to advance the social policy preferences of these Trump voters, though economic initiatives to build roads, highways, bridges, airports, tunnels, and railways have not happened. Under Attorney General Jefferson Sessions, the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division is pursuing lawsuits against universities suspected of overemphasizing race in their affirmative action admissions policies. The Justice Department and the Department of Housing and Urban Development, headed by Ben Carson, have stopped filing disparate impact suits to advance the Fair Housing Act's goal of fighting racial discrimination in housing. The Trump administration also quietly ended a federal grant to a group working to oppose white nationalist extremist organizations. It created a commission to investigate vote fraud led by one of the nation's most extreme proponents of anti-immigrant and voter restriction laws, Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach. The commission faltered, but administration and Republican support for voter initiatives that are likely to suppress non-white voting continue. 
Sessions and former Trump advisor Steve Bannon have each praised the race-based national origins quota immigration system of the 1920s. Though there are no plans to revive it, the administration is adding a citizenship question to the census that may aid deportations, and it favors immigration legislation that would not only replace family unification priorities that have fostered demographic diversity with preferences for high-skilled immigrants, it would also reduce overall legal immigration. In light of all these policies, it is difficult to see Trump's America First program as genuinely respectful toward and responsive to all Americans, or even as clearly committed to democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Americans, therefore, have a civic and moral duty, I believe, to explore whether there are better stories of American peoplehood that can check these features of Trump's America First vision while also responding to the legitimate concerns to which he has spoken powerfully. Three distinguishable narratives appear particularly promising. These are first, American politics as a democratic project, the view of John Dewey and others. Second, America as a constitutional endeavor seeking a more perfect union without effacing diversity, the e pluribus unum story, told best by Barack Obama. And third, America defined by the Declaration of Independence project of extending rights to all, the vision articulated most memorably by Abraham Lincoln. So first, democratic stories. As is well known, many of the framers of the American Constitution, including James Madison himself, harbored deep fears about the dangers of democracies and insisted they were creating republics with governance by elected representatives, but not direct popular rule. Their embrace of popular self-governance proved, however, difficult to cabin. With fits, starts, and some important reversals, the ensuing history of the United States displays wider and deeper embraces of democracy. These include the renaming of the party of Jefferson as the Democrats in the age of Jackson, the expansion of the franchise to all white men, then all men, then all male and female citizens over 21, and eventually 18-year-olds as well, and the adoption of direct election of judges in many states in the 19th century and of U.S. senators via the 17th Amendment, as well as the democratization of candidate selection processes through the spread of primaries in the 20th century. These historic developments suggest that stories of America as a democratic project have a serious claim to be the stories that have done the most to advance inclusive egalitarian visions of American peoplehood in the past, and they may be the best to do so today. Commitments to democracy, in fact, suggest an important alternative to the strategy of developing good stories of peoplehood that I'm advocating here. Perhaps egalitarian inclusion is most attainable through promoting broad, often grassroots, democratic engagement in self-governance without advancing any particular account of who the people are. Perhaps organizing around resistance to specific forms of oppression, exploitation, and domination in the name of achieving more democratic and egalitarian conditions is both sufficient and safer. America's greatest democratic theorist, John Dewey, often argued in this vein. More recently, in calling for a left populism, the European political theorist Chantal Mouffe has acknowledged the risk that to bring together democratic demands in the creation of a people will produce, or worse, presume, a homogenous subject, one that negates plurality. However, as Dewey sometimes did, and as I've done here, Mouf argues that the democratic projects must be congruent with the values and identities of those they seek to join in support of common causes. They must start from where people are and how they feel, offering them, in her words, a vision of the future that gives them hope. At the current historical juncture, Mouffe contends, this often means beginning at the national level and mobilizing people around a patriotic identification with the best and most egalitarian aspects of the national tradition. She does not go so far as to argue that we must develop better stories of peoplehood or to analyze how this might be done, but her arguments point in this direction. Mouffe stops short, however, precisely because she wants notions of the people to be constructed around democracy, with democratic values in the leading role in defining political identities everywhere, not distinctive accounts of particular peoplehood. This is an endeavor worth pursuing. Still, there are several reasons to doubt 
whether devotion to democracy as the central goal of political life can provide a sufficient sense of common purpose to play the mobilizing role asked of it. In this regard, sociologist Ruth Brownstein's 2017 book, Prophets and Patriots, Faith and Democracy Across the Political Divide, is instructive. Brownstein engaged in extensive ethnographic observations and discussions beginning in 2010 with members of a liberal religious activist group called Interfaith and a conservative Tea Party group called the Patriots. Brownstein found that though these groups differed sharply on many issues and though they organized in different ways, they shared both some common grievances and some common ideals. They embraced a, quote, similar ideal of good citizenship, understanding it to mean active engagement in furthering what they saw as the American democratic project. In this, Brownstein very reasonably found some hope. She argued, much as I have done, that as long as multiple groups cultivate and enact different stories of America and no single story becomes dominant, their commitments to democratic engagement might lead them to search for sufficient common ground and to accept enough compromises to hold the nation together and even enable it to progress. Brownstein also noted, however, that despite their overlapping senses of commitment to the project of American democracy, her two groups had fundamental disagreements on a number of issues that appeared nearly impossible to resolve. It is not clear whether even the strong and shared sense of these groups that they are dedicated to advancing democracy can foster enough willingness to accommodate each other to enable them to work together constructively. The very fact that Brownstein's prophets and patriots are activists, moreover, probably indicates that they are more drawn to democratic engagement than most Americans are. It's true that civic republican and more modern democratic traditions valorizing active public service constitute significant features of American political culture. Even so, it's likely that most Americans see democratic activism the way that Oscar Wilde famously described socialism. It takes up too many of one's evenings. <laughs> there are also other challenges facing efforts to motivate an inclusive egalitarian politics through appeals to democracy alone. As the history of the United States and many other countries shows, if democracy means unqualified majoritarian rule, the rights of many minorities, especially ethnocultural minorities, are not likely to be safe. And as James Madison warned, and as Francis Rosenbluth and Ian Shapiro have recently affirmed, many institutions, such as the selection of representatives, can be excessively or at least poorly democratized, making it necessary to save democracy from itself in their phrase, or to find a Republican remedy for the diseases most incident to Republican government, in Madison's phrase. Perhaps most disturbingly, less than half of young Americans today say they take an active interest in politics and they are less inclined to affirm democracy as always the best form of government than older Americans are. So there are serious obstacles to seeking to make democratic values the central theme of American political life, though to be sure, all conceivable options face obstacles. Still, these considerations suggest that in addition to stories of Americans as a people engaged in democratic self-governance, other desirable stories of American peoplehood may be needed in the quest to spur movements that can defeat pathological forms of populism. So next, the e pluribus unum story. The preamble to the Constitution summarizes the purposes that we, the people of the United States, gave their federal government, and the first goal is to form a more perfect union. Soon thereafter, in 1789, Congress adopted the Great Seal of the United States with a design that included the motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many one. Since the nation's founding, it has always been possible to narrate the American people as devoted to forming a greater unity out of their manifold diversity. Yet no American political leader has ever identified the American story and his own story so fully with that goal as Barack Obama did, beginning with the speech at the 2004 Democratic Convention that catapulted him to prominence. There, Obama expressed gratitude for the diversity of my heritage, and he stressed that his biography was, quote, part of the larger American story in ways that made him indebted to America, since in no other country on earth, he said, could his story be even possible. 
Obama traced that possibility back to America's commitment to the proposition in the Declaration of Independence that all are created equal. Obama did not, however, contend that the American project was simply or chiefly to secure equal rights for all. Instead, he maintained, using biblical and familial language, that alongside our famous individualism, there's another ingredient in the American saga, a belief that we're all connected as one people. I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. It's what allows us to pursue our individual dreams and yet still come together as one American family, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. The larger story of America that Obama portrayed then was one that appealed to the Declaration of Independence, but interpreted it in light of the nation's religious traditions of moral obligation and civic republican conceptions of civic virtues and duties. In his 2000 speech announcing his candidacy for the presidency, Obama said his campaign was about reclaiming the meaning of citizenship, restoring our sense of common purpose. When his campaign faced a crisis due to inflammatory remarks by his pastor, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, Obama responded with a speech at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia that began by interpreting the Constitution as stained by this nation's original sin of slavery, but with the answer to the slavery question, Obama contended, already embedded in it. Describing that answer, Obama said the Constitution had at its very core the ideal of equal citizenship under the law and promised its people liberty and justice and a union that could be and should be perfected over time. To continue in that quest, Obama asserted, Americans needed to see that we may have different stories, but we hold common hopes. We all want to move in the same direction, defined by the idea that out of many, we are truly one. In a speech at Cairo later in 2009, Obama restated his claim that America was shaped by every culture drawn from every end of the earth and dedicated to a simple concept, e pluribus unum, out of many one. He then affirmed that this aim was a cosmopolitan one, asserting that globally as well as domestically, all people have a responsibility to one, ano to one another as human beings to work together for common benefit. Speaking again to his fellow Americans in his 2012 nomination acceptance speech, Obama maintained that the nation's founding beliefs in inalienable rights fostered commitments to personal responsibility and individual initiative, but also to citizenship, the idea that this country only works when we accept certain obligations to one another and to future generations. And in his eloquent second inaugural, Obama called the Declaration self-evident truths of human equality and inalienable rights what makes us Americans while insisting that preserving our individual freedoms ultimately requires collective action as one nation and one people as citizens. Obama's remarkable success in becoming the nation's first African-American president and then a two-term president proves that this e pluribus unum story, especially in his telling, had undeniable resonance. It promised respect for all in ways that would give recognition to many forms of diversity. It thus complies with the three R's of good stories of peoplehood that I've laid out. The experience of Obama's presidency, however, raises cautionary concerns, one that Obama himself came to express. I've argued that Obama conceived of the American quest of e pluribus unum as best pursued in the spirit of John Dewey's democratic pragmatism and modern theories of deliberative democracy. Even as Obama stressed that most forms of diversity need not and should not be suppressed in efforts to achieve a more perfect union, his openness to whatever solutions pragmatic deliberative democratic process, processes produced meant that his vision of union could appear devoid of any specific content and therefore somewhat hollow. Still more importantly, when Republicans in Congress refused to engage in good faith democratic deliberations and negotiations, Obama's e pluribus unum conception of the American project gave him no real guidance as to how to respond. His best hope was simply to defeat his intransigent opponents at the polls. While Obama remained popular, however, he did not find a way to sustain, much less expand, the broad base of support for his party he built in 2008. During his re-election campaign in 2012, Obama said that the mistake of my first term was thinking that this job was just about getting the policy right. The nature of this office is to tell a story to the American people that gives them a sense of unity and purpose and optimism, especially during tough times. 
His second inaugural address told his E Pluribus Unum story as well as he or perhaps anyone else has ever done, but it did, it did not alter the reality of a nation that was growing more polarized, not more united. His foreign policy advisor and speechwriter Ben Rhodes has written that late in his second term, Obama read Yuval Harari's Sapiens and was reinforced in the belief that his job was to, quote, tell a really good story about who we are. At Hiroshima in May 2016, Obama reflected that nations, quote, arise, telling a story that binds people together in sacrifice and cooperation, but those same stories have so often been used to oppress and dehumanize those who are different. He said, my own nation's story began with simple words, all men are created equal and endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Realizing that ideal has never been easy, but staying true to that story is worth the effort. This time, however, Obama did not explicitly identify the American story with the quest to achieve e pluribus unum, though he did insist that the radical and necessary notion that we are part of a single human family, that is the story that we all must tell. He seemed to acknowledge tacitly that American peoplehood should perhaps be narrated somewhat differently than he had done during the preceding dozen years. If Obama had indeed reached that conclusion, I will next argue that he was correct. <coughs> when Obama said at Hiroshima, as he had said previously, that his nation's story began with the words of the Declaration of Independence, he was advancing a debatable and long debated view. Following the example of many antebellum Protestant Whigs, Ronald Reagan usually identified the nation's origins with John Winthrop's speech to the Puritans when Winthrop promised that they would be as a city upon a hill. Scholars have often noted that the adoption of the Constitution rather than the Declaration is the origin of America's national government and courts as well as critics of the Declaration have often insisted that this second founding is the truly authoritative one. The most influential expression of the view that America instead began with the Declaration of Independence is Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in 1863 and its famous opening, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. If we do the math and recognize the last five words, we know he's referring to 1776 and the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln did not arrive at this view of the nation's starting point in 1863, nor did he originate it. Lincoln also did not interpret its implications precisely as Barack Obama would do, as a mandate to pursue e pluribus unum, greater unity without effacing diversity. Instead, Lincoln spoke in a broad American tradition of invoking the Declaration in order to claim that more people should have their basic rights better secured. That tradition already included Jacksonian working men's advocates and the antebellum women's rights movement, and it has gone on through the course of U.S. history to include champions of property rights, but also human rights, civil rights, LGBTQ rights, disability rights, and other rights up to the present day. Lincoln spoke particularly in the tradition of, though not in full agreement with, the advocates of anti-slavery constitutionalism, including the Massachusetts abolitionist Lysander Spooner and the editor and former slave Frederick Douglass. In 1845, Spooner published The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, arguing that the people of this country first announced their independent political existence <clears throat> in a document that amounted to constitutional law and that took as a self-evident truth the principle that all men had a natural right to liberty, making slavery unconstitutional a position Spooner insisted the 1787 Constitution did not disavow. Frederick Douglass, building on Spooner, came after his break with the Garrisonian abolitionists to argue, citing the Supreme Court, that in reading legal documents, the language of the law must be construed strictly in favor of justice and liberty. Since the Constitution did not use the word slavery and instead promised, like the Declaration, to secure the blessings of liberty, Douglas maintained Americans could and should read it as an anti-slavery document. Lincoln did not agree that the Constitution by itself banned slavery. 
Still, he and the new Republican Party came to adopt a moderate version of anti-slavery constitutionalism in the 1850s and 1860s. They contended that the Constitution had been intended and should be administered to pursue the fulfillment of the principles of the Declaration by putting slavery on the path to preferably peaceful, gradual, but ultimately complete extinction. In speeches of the 1850s, Lincoln often called the Declaration's proclamation of human equality and inalienable rights a maxim set up for future use. It should be, he said, constantly looked to, constantly labored for, and even though never perfectly attained, constantly approximated, and so constantly spreading and deepening its influence, thereby augmenting the happiness and value of life to all people of all colors everywhere. Lincoln's embrace of this view propelled him through more personal growth on racial issues than many modern critics appreciate. Though he had earlier urged only that African Americans deserved equality in regard to the basic rights of the Declaration of Independence, not full political equality, Lincoln eventually concluded that if African Americans were to gain meaningful possession of even those basic rights, many of them would need the franchise. His announcement of that position spurred his assassination by John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln's evolution on the question of African American voting rights highlights a fundamental difference between his understanding of American peoplehood as a project of fulfilling the principles of the Declaration of Independence and Barack Obama's. For Obama, the goal was fostering unity through processes of deliberative democracy. If unity did not emerge, it was not clear what to do. For Lincoln, the goal was more specific and less conciliatory. It was the extension of basic rights to all, a project that policies must advance, and a project that could justify overriding, sometimes by force, the preferences of those who would deny rights to some. Lincoln's conception of American peoplehood stands in far more striking contrast, however, to Trump's America First vision. To be sure, Lincoln cast this Declaration of Independence-inspired quest more as a means to make America a shining example to the world than an effort to justify any expansive American rule beyond our borders. Lincoln's focus was on holding the nation together. Yet despite this similarity to Trump, when Lincoln said the nation should labor to spread the influence of the Declaration of Independence to augment the happiness and value of life for all people, he meant all people. There were no other people who didn't matter. At the height of the popularity of the anti-immigration know-nothings in the 1850s, Lincoln wrote his friend Joshua Speed, I am not a know-nothing. That is certain. How could I be? How could anyone who abhors the oppression of Negroes be in favor of degrading classes of white people? Our progress in degeneracy appears to me to be pretty rapid. As a nation, we began by declaring that all men are created equal. We now practically read it all men are created equal except Negroes. When the know-nothings get control, it will read all men are created equal except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. Today, I think Lincoln would add, and Muslims. Though Lincoln was first and foremost concerned about his fellow citizens, it is clear that he thought that if any policies worked against the goal of securing the enjoyment of Declaration of Independence rights for all people everywhere, those policies violated the values to which the American people were and should be dedicated. And whether or not Lincoln and the Republicans were right to see the original Constitution as dedicated to the Declaration of Independence project of securing rights for all, they wrote their vision into the Constitution in the form of the three great Civil War amendments. It can now even more clearly claim constitutional authority. Even prior to that, throughout U.S. history and indeed throughout the world, so many diverse movements have chosen to invoke the principles of the Declaration that its story, like democratic stories, has great claim to be a major historical asset for inclusive egalitarian reforms, even though the wealthy have also used it to buttress their economic privileges. Part of its resonance comes from its support for a great variety of pursuits of happiness, not any single vision of human fulfillment. Consequently, I believe this sense of American identity, as distinctively dedicated to the Declaration of Independence project of expanding the enjoyment of basic rights, provides a more broadly appealing and sustaining sense of purpose than either Democratic stories or Obama's E Pluribus Unum story. Still, to many years, 
this narrative of American identity sounds several alarms. It may lead Americans to be obsessed with claiming rights for themselves as individuals instead of pursuing common goods. Or Americans may rest satisfied with a formal equality of rights that belies the fact that many live in conditions of crippling material inequalities. Worst of all, more privileged Americans may use claims to be protecting rights to impose their own self-interested conceptions of how others should live on diverse communities at home and abroad. These concerns have force. They suggest Americans must significantly expand upon the Civil War Republicans' understanding of what securing meaningful rights for all entails. As the intertwined history of modern labor and civil rights struggles has long since affirmed, policies and practices must help people acquire the economic, educational, and political resources and capabilities they need to exercise their rights. Today, in the United States as elsewhere, it is vital to address the needs and concerns of both the deeply disadvantaged and those constituencies who, though better off, still feel economically and culturally endangered by globalizing trends. Americans disagree sharply about how to do so, particularly in regards to redistributive measures, public investments, and direct public provision of services. Lincoln favored, among other things, state investment in public roads and highways, public schools, charities, and orphanages, as well as the administration of criminal and civil justice systems, along with all other things that the people, in his words, cannot do at all or cannot so well do for themselves. Lincoln's list goes too far for some today. Still, most Americans appear willing to support some forms of national aid to communities and workers that lose jobs due to economic globalization or necessary environmental regulations. Many now recognize that the benefits of immigration tend to be national, but the burdens are often locally concentrated, making assistance programs for regions facing demands for expanded social services from very recent immigrants appropriate. Trade agreements that include better pay for workers in immigrant sending regions are part of the answer to both economic and cultural concerns, and to his credit, Trump has sought them. A still greater opportunity in this regard, however, is the America First promise Trump has neglected. Public infrastructure spending on construction of transportation, communications, energy production, water supply, and educational facilities with environmental protections. These investments could generate employment for displaced native workers who supported Trump and for the immigrants he has assailed, while spurring sustained economic growth for many decades. As Lincoln came to recognize in regard to the nation's African-American citizens, it's also a continuing task for Americans to improve their democratic institutions, certainly by removing instead of imposing barriers to participation perhaps by altering candidate selection processes to reduce the influence of extremist activists. Most important now is to find ways to restructure the rules and practices of Congress to restore it to its past role as the centerpiece of representative governance before heightened electoral preoccupations and polarization led it to abandon authority to the other branches. It is, moreover, simply true that powerful groups have often prompted American governments to pursue their interests by imposing their preferred ways of life, their preferred forms of economic activities and cultural pursuits on many minorities at home and on other political societies abroad. These practices violate the Declaration of Independence Project, for its rights include the pursuit of happiness and people's notions of happiness legitimately vary, as do the social, economic, and political barriers they face. To be effective, policies seeking to enable all to enjoy their basic rights securely, therefore, must be not just resonant and respectful, but also what I'm calling reticulated policies, by which I mean they cannot treat all persons in strictly uniform fashion. Americans must engage in continuing, changing contextual judgments about what forms of affirmatively accommodating treatment of groups and identities will augment the happiness and value of life for all concerned, and what forms of differential treatment will instead foster divisions, inequalities, and injustices. Those judgments are difficult, but they are unavoidable if Americans are to respect legitimate differences in ways that build on the best aspects of our common heritage to engage in a shared enterprise that benefits all. 
For Americans to make these policy judgments well, I have argued that we need to develop a new civic ethos. We must encourage all to pursue amongst the diverse forms of happiness they may seek individually and as communities those that are most valuable to others as well as to themselves, in part because those choices do most to permit and sometimes assist others in pursuing their distinctive forms of happiness. <clears throat> Many modern societies professing liberal democratic principles have defined the justice they seek to establish in terms of the harm principle of John Stuart Mill, which contended the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. Modern millions often wisely fear that these harms will be defined in terms of the ethnocentric definitions of civilized communities that Mill himself often endorsed. Consequently, they adapt Mill's harm principle along lines like those of the 19th century American philosopher and anti-slavery advocate Ralph Waldo Emerson. Today, it's more customary to suggest that each person is entitled to the maximum amount of self-defined freedom and self-realization possible, consistent with the self-defined freedom and self-realization of others, rather than invoking the standards of civilized communities. This turn to protection of self-defined freedoms, however, raises a great danger. Persons pursuing pluralist, pluralistic forms of self-realization may well clash far more than they cooperate. But recall that today, even more than in the past, most people recognize themselves as complex beings with many affiliations, identities, and aspirations, and so many, so multiple possible identities. That awareness can feel, I have suggested, as if we're hearing a cacophony of stories of our possible peoplehood making simple, narrow nationalist appeals, India first, America first, attractive, Yet that same awareness may inspire us to embrace more reticulated forms of policy in public life within our society and across societies. It might enable us to see that we can seek satisfying forms of self-realization in many different ways, ways that while they would provide roughly equal satisfaction for us, might have better or worse consequences for others. And then to show respect for those others, we must take those consequences seriously in the choices we make. I've therefore suggested that in pursuit of their Declaration of Independence project, Americans should adopt a modified million maxim as both a personal and civic ethos. That modified maxim is the best uses of their powers by communities and individuals are those that aid others without doing harm to themselves, both to meet our own needs and goals and to do right by our fellow citizens in the 21st century we need to go beyond focusing on harm prevention. To be sure, efforts to combat harms, including disabling forms of discrimination, subordination, and material hardship, must remain central. And those efforts will remain difficult, with clashes over what constitutes harm and who is responsible for harms. Yet it still makes sense to strive more consciously to exercise our rights individually and as a nation in ways that benefit others, not just ourselves. Doing so means at times we should favor giving accommodations and exemptions in public policies to some individuals and groups, because doing so will not do harm to ourselves, and it will enable others to pursue happiness as they define it more successfully and in ways more practically equal to our own opportunities. Instead of simply live and let live, we need a civic ethos of live and help live. Aided by this ethos, the American Declaration of Independence project can become not only resonant and respectful, but one that provides guides for more appropriately reticulated policies and practices than it has fostered in the nation's past. Legislators and executives devising public policies and courts adjudicating them should apply this modified maxim when responding to the claims of a wide range of advocates for special exemptions and accommodations, including religious groups, linguistic, cultural, ethnic, and racial minorities, the poor, the disabled, women, LGBTQ persons and groups, children, the elderly, and more. Rather than regarding all special treatment as suspect, as is often the case now, American lawmakers and courts should reverse the burden of proof. They should only reject the claims of groups to affirmative accommodations when those denials are necessary to achieve compelling governmental purposes. 
purposes which must be more than simple hostility to the groups in question or simply a concern that they give the nation total allegiance. To be truly inclusive and respectful toward all, moreover, those efforts at accommodation must include conservative religious groups, as well as displaced workers, new immigrants, long disadvantaged minorities, and more. For many, probably many here, this may be the implication of the Declaration of Independence project that's most difficult to accept. There are many good reasons to worry that this call for extensive accommodations will only heighten fragmentation and inequality, not promote an egalitarian, inclusive sense of common endeavor. In assessing the force of this very appropriate concern, one fundamental safeguard should be borne in mind. If we believe in equal rights, if we accept that each group and individual should have rights that have comparable value but not greater value than those granted to other groups and individuals, then we may frequently find the denials of demands for special rights and accommodations are justified by compelling state interests. Once governments provide accommodations to any one group, they must provide them to all groups who similarly claim those accommodations are vital to their pursuits of happiness. This means that both legislators and courts must ask what the consequences will be of granting, for example, exemptions from the Affordable Care Act requirements not only to conservative religious groups, and to corporations owned by small groups of religious believers, but to all entities who make similar demands, a position the Trump administration has endorsed. If there are many other such bodies, then the accommodations in total may be too costly, both in dollars and in terms of their impacts on other public goals, to be acceptable. Similarly, if we repeal the 1954 Johnson Amendment to the Tax Code and permit religious groups to endorse political candidates, as President Trump has moved to do, we must allow all tax-exempt advocacy groups to endorse candidates. We cannot grant religious traditionalists full political speech rights and ta tax exemptions while denying one or the other to environmental and animal rights advocacy groups. It's not clear the Trump administration would support granting full political speech rights to tax-exempt organizations under these circumstances. Finally, if the refusal of fundamentalist religious cake designers to serve same-sex couples means that those couples will have few opportunities to purchase desirable cakes or that they will face related kinds of material burdens, then exemptions from general policies of non-discrimination when serving the public would be illegitimate. If, however, requests for accommodations really are confined to a small number of groups, businesses, and individuals, while the interests of those adversely affected by those accommodations can be met through relatively costless alternative policies, then it is wise and just to support those accommodations. I include those conservative cake bakers so long as they publicly advertise their policies, lessening occasions for embarrassing confrontations and painful confrontations, and also, I think, costing them a great deal of business. Now, it's true that those denied service may well feel their dignity and identities have been disrespected. But it's also true that those compelled to provide service equally feel their dignity and identities have been disrespected. So long as same-sex couples can receive respectful service from most other providers, a civic ethos of accommodation whenever possible calls for permitting religious bakers an exemption. In sum, we should take seriously the claims for accommodations advanced by long discriminated against or neglected communities and those put forth by groups experiencing new economic anxieties due to economic globalization, environmental regulations, technological innovations, and unresponsive public policies, and the claims of traditional religious and cultural communities whose feelings of threatened status led them to embrace Trump's vision. If accommodations and exemptions do not go so far as to permit some to burden what modern Americans define as basic civil rights and compelling public purposes, uh, these accommodations may well contribute to civic peace and heighten civic engagement, improving the prospects for many to pursue happiness in fulfilling ways. Perhaps paradoxically but beneficially, the incredibly rich diversity of modern America makes it likely that many requests for distinctive privileges will be advanced by so few groups that they can be granted. These policies would moreover promote the flourishing of a wide variety of diverse civil associations of the sort that many have long thought to be America's best schools for citizenship. 
Such associations can help foster the sort of civic ethos that Americans need. They are often great venues for developing habits and practices of working cooperatively with others for the pursuit not just of individual self-interest, but also of common goods. Through those pursuits, a wide range of economic and cultural communities, from Midwestern farmers to public sector labor organizers to immigrant advocacy groups to fundamentalist Christians to militantly proud deaf culture groups to persons of mixed race descent to families with transgender members may all come to feel that they are truly part of the larger American political project. They might then work together to realize a vision of America as a pluralist but unified nation that strives seriously and persistently to make meaningful enjoyment of the basic Declaration of Independence rights possible for all. These are the reasons why I find a civic narrative of America as a people dedicated to realizing the principles of the Declaration of Independence for all over time, a far more compelling and promising vision than Trump's America First story, or even the democratic stories of figures like Dewey or the e pluribus unum story of Obama. But as its invocation on behalf of many very different positions throughout U.S. history indicates, this Declaration of Independence narrative provides no certain guides for addressing all the problems that beset modern America. It also has limitations that may well lead many Americans to prefer a different account of their identities and purposes. As stated at the outset, even though I favor this story, my goal is not to argue that this is the single conception of American civic identity to which all should give allegiance, much less total allegiance. As the writer Chimamandi Ngozi Adichie has said in a widely viewed TED talk, the danger of a single story is that it can rob people of dignity by making, of our, making our recognition of our equal humanity with full awareness of our differences difficult. Consequently, I hope instead to encourage others to identify and advance the better stories of peoplehood that most appeal to them. Then we can look for areas of overlap, the issues where we can find common ground for resistance to injustices and common paths for progress. It is not by all coming to adopt any one story of peoplehood, but rather through many people advancing different stories, all saying that xenophobia, racism, misogyny, and religious bigotry are not who we are now as Americans, that the United States can become not only more united, but the best that we can hope to make it. We must look for many stories that resonate, that are respectful, and that are reticulated, stories that provide secure places for as many diverse groups as possible in the networks that comprise our society and in the larger regional and global networks to which we can productively belong. By doing so, we may find that our stories have many harmonies and that we can collectively build bridges across our divides. If we build well, they will be bridges on which we all can stand and bridges from which we can all look out with new hope toward the future whose story we all will write. Perhaps we can write and tell and live better stories of peoplehood than all those that have gone before. Thank you. Was it for divorce, Rogers? Um, and in keeping with the traditions of EP&E, uh, we will ask for questions from students first. Uh, yeah, I agree with Ian. Uh, I one of the narratives that was in the back of my mind too is especially when you brought the example of Barack Obama and positioning Obama not only as you know, uh, an interlocutor of this larger American study story, but also of a larger African-American story, right? right. Uh, he's putting forward the vision of the place of African-Americans within America. That is very much in love with MLK, that's, uh, and even before that. Uh, but you know, there are, I think movements like Black Lives Matter, what they've now put forth is, where is reckoning in the story of America, right? Uh, and even W.B. Du Bois writes about it in uh, Black Reconstruction, right, in saying that a lot of what this civic Republicans did was actually acknowledge we did, you know, America's nation did this wrong, now let's try to fix it. The problem is the long night that came after Black, after the Reconstruction period, right, uh, which doesn't fare well for now, hopes that this can be part of it, but 
do you think there's a chance for that reckoning, right? For an acknowledgement, you know, in the way that Canada is doing right now towards indigenous peoples, in the way that uh, a lot of African nations had to in the aftermath of decolonization. I think that there's a uh, potential and also a danger. Um, if the presentation of the need for reckoning is presented um, uh, primarily as a message uh, that um, uh, white Americans at least need to feel deep shame, even though I think that's justified in many respects, it is likely to be a politically counterproductive message. If the reckoning is presented as part of a story of, uh, yes, these are failings and here's how we can do better. If it is, if you don't focus on the shame but as the, for on the opportunity for improvement, then you can have the reckoning and use it as a source of mobilization. And in this regard, in relation to Barack Obama, I think one of the mistakes that he made, although it's understandable, is that uh, he steered away from identifying himself too strongly with the black church social justice tradition, which I believe he genuinely identified with. And he did invoke it uh, on occasion and you know, very beautifully in his Charleston um, uh, uh, eulogy and on other occasions, but I think he was worried uh, that if he uh, identified himself too strongly uh, with the black church role in civil rights struggles, he would be perceived as only caring about black Americans and he would lose uh, support. Uh, but I think, in fact, um, uh, that kind of sense of moral purpose, for many religious purpose, uh, is something that resonated with many Americans beyond uh, black Americans and it could be a useful way uh, of saying uh, that um, yes we've done things that are sources of shame but this is part of a project of um, uh, human improvement uh, and uh, the uh, religious narrative naturally lends itself to this uh, story of failing but trying to do better and uh, he might have been able uh, to encourage some sense of reckoning while motivating um, a sense of purposeful progress, but he felt he couldn't do it too much because he felt it would mark him too much as a black president and not everybody's president. Um, he's a better politician than I am, so maybe he was right, but I still think there may have been a lost opportunity there. I, I I have a question about the, the four narratives. How much, how much are they aspirational versus formational or identity ones? Especially, right, because the, the claim will be the following. If, if this is what makes the people, American people, into the people, in other words, is this what I do, do to identify who's an American and who's not? Then the problem is that some of the stronger versions like the, the one of you have to be thinking of others, uh, th this mentality. Uh, what happens if there is a member that all of us recognize, like we might think of them as Americans, but they fail in this category, and according to you, we have to remove them from the people. Um, and I think that's problematic, but, but independently from that, I think there's a second problem, which is as a member of the people, you can turn to them and say like, look, we have these aspirations. We have these aspirations to be like non-discriminatory. And since you're a part of us, then you should also change your point of view to, uh, to have the same aspirations because you're a member of the people. Right? So the problem is if, 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 you, if you make the, the aspirations into what makes the people into people, they start removing people, and then you cannot return to them and tell them, hey, I know you're a racist, but you shouldn't do that because you're not a good American. And he'll turn to you and be like, you just told me I'm not an American. I failed your test. Mm -hmm. So I think if, if we put a brain on, on yeah. Trump and looked at his definition, the conservative definition, like the loyalty one seems to be just what makes America, right? it's actually a generous one, right? If you're loyal to America, the, the total allegiance is too crazy, but the loyalty one, the, the second line, the loyalty one, if, if America is a country that you're loyal to, independent of your beliefs, that actually allows for people who were born in another country who lived here all their life, right? The loyalty can be there. So it's actually, 
relatively generous if it's not aspirational, if it's just constructive? Well, I'd say that um, uh, where I disagree with you is that I uh, don't interpret <coughs> the civic ethos as a standard uh, for uh, deciding uh, who gets to be part of the people. Uh, it is um, uh, it is an aspirational uh, morality, and we might use it to judge um, uh, who's a better citizen and who's a worse citizen, but not who is a citizen. Um, and uh, I'd also want to stress that uh, one of the advantages of the Declaration of Independence understanding is that it embraces the notion that there are diverse pursuits of happiness. So the fact that your happiness isn't necessarily fulfilled by following this uh, uh, maxim uh, doesn't make you not a member of the uh, political uh, community. So this isn't a test uh, for membership. Um, it is rather a kind of um, uh, ethos designed uh, if a lot of people embrace it uh, to make membership work better. Uh, uh, but uh, the, uh, it's an ethos nonetheless uh, that accepts uh, the legitimacy of pluralism and difference and therefore um, is not a basis for expelling uh, someone from the uh, community. Whereas I think if you say you have to give total allegiance to the United States, um, uh, then there are many, many uh, identities and aspirations uh, that are uh, suppressed uh, by that. I don't want to give total allegiance to the United States. And, and so. Yeah. Um, I appreciated you pointing out the hollowness of, of almost the culture of this story. And I um, know we're not in a psychology lecture, but I think of uh, Obama and Trump as sort of like super ego and it, where Obama was such like a super ego overdrive that he's so dignified and so lofty, he always wants us to summon our, our better impulses, he's such a great speaker. And and then Trump is like the seething cauldron of, of id, that, like embracing our worst impulses, our fear of the other or whatever. And I appreciate you pointing out that he, it's like Obama had no game plan to, to address the, the id, the, the id element in society. But um, what I wanted to ask you is I, what I'm hearing, what I'm getting from your lecture, you, you never use the word, I don't think you use the word in your talk or in the, the word assimilation, but that's that's the, a, a strain that I'm hearing, like that, that this question of um, these subcultures, religious, linguistic, cultural, ethnic, these subcultures, you know, do they do they give up what they are? Is, is it going to be a salad bowl where the subcultures just stay what they are and they're all just all different, you know, subcultures are, are sort of next to each other, but they're not mixing, or do you give up who you are and really assimilate into to some, I don't know, American something that, I, I don't know, is that, is that So my word is, um, is extensive accommodations, not assimilation, but um, I don't, uh, my emphasis is that we need to learn to be more comfortable with what is a reality. We have multiple identities and memberships, um, and uh, it should not be a choice uh, between uh, simply embracing one um, at the expense of the suppression of others. Our task is to find ways to accommodate <coughs> the um, uh, peaceful and flexible uh, uh, pursuit of lives in uh, multiple communities and memberships. And so uh, that means uh, that a strongly assimilationist ideology is hostile to what I'm uh, talking about. It is true uh, that, um, you know, uh, in the first lecture I talked about how uh, the fragmentation in modern life can create so many uh, claims on us that people experience themselves as hearing a cacophony of stories about who they are and who they should be. And uh, that creates difficulties in way I'm trying to encourage an ethos uh, that um, makes us a little more comfortable uh, living with the fact uh, that we will uh, be a member of a subgroup and a member of an American nation and a member of transnational communities all at once. I think it's, um, uh, in some respects, you can say it's psychologically hard to do. And yet the reality is that we do it to some degree all the time now. And we just need to, I think, begin to develop an understanding uh, that really that's the way it should be. Yeah. Thanks so much.
Um, I'm kind of wondering something, especially since Professor Skronik isn't here, that there's something I think he would maybe bring up tied to his work that he and um, Karen Oren did on the kind of evolution in America from rights as trumps to rights as chips. So in incorporating rights is a pretty kind of important piece of this project. To what extent does America need to go through kind of a more fulfilling revisitation of rights just even as a political concept before a lot of this could even work out? Well, I'm sympathetic to that argument. Um, I haven't put it rights as chips. I uh, have put it that uh, rights are tools, not trumps. Uh, rights are um, uh, really <coughs> uh, a kind of legal and policy device for helping structure things to accomplish uh, our purposes, and we should not treat them as um, uh, absolutes because uh, no tool works um, forever or for every situation. Uh, but at the same time, it is often useful to construct policies and institutions uh, with rights uh, as means to accomplish our goals. And so I think we do need uh, an acceptance of uh, rights as tools. I acknowledge that this is in some tension with the original understanding of the Declaration of Independence as inalienable rights, older natural rights uh, doctrines. And in this sense, I do want to say that the modern version of the doctrine uh, does uh, refound its goals on uh, more uh, uh, pragmatist foundations to a large degree, but does maintain true to the same basic goals. Thank you. Um, about your uh, the section about special interests being kind of a, a threat to be aware of, in the case of the conservative cake bakers, what is there to guarantee that that situation is the case where a client or customer would have other options available to them, and how do you take that on balance when you're looking at you know an exemption is something that must potentially be able to be extended over a larger state? I think uh, that. Uh, you look at the actual empirical reality of the situation in um, the context where the case arises, um, and if things change over time, you change the policy. <clears throat> the reality is uh, that in the Masterpiece Cake um, uh, incident, uh, they said it was not a problem to purchase a cake. We could have gotten a cake dozens of other places. We just felt offended because we weren't served, and I understand that I find it offensive they weren't served. Uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, the baker felt offended that his religious views were not being respected by uh, public policy. What do you do with that conflict? Um, I think you have to look at um, uh, who's really getting hurt, and if they can get uh, I think it's fair to require them to advertise, you know, we don't serve uh, same-sex couples um, uh, because then you don't go in and have a confrontation um, uh, that's painful. And uh, I also think that in 21st century America right now, that would cost them business. Um, and uh, so I think you could drive out that kind of discrimination. But if it worked out differently, if it worked out that there were pervasive patterns of not serving, as was true in the days of Jim Crow, then you have to ban that. Because then you are really depriving people of opportunities in the marketplace. But if you're not really depriving people of opportunities in the marketplace, and the conservative uh, religious baker uh, feels less alienated, denounced, um, trampled upon, I think we should try to do it say, you know, um, uh, we value diverse ways, of diverse pursuits of happiness. You know, I don't agree with yours, but um, as long as you're not hurting other people in any substantial way, you can pursue it. Yeah. Thank you. What is, Please. How, how do you measure, kind of, or uh, understand whether something is, uh, how, do you, how do you assess whether something is a legitimate religious conviction or something that is, kind of essential to someone's identity or beliefs and what may be used as an excuse for more kind of political inclinations or just like distaste of a certain, certain kind of person? You don't. The government can't get in the business of deciding uh, whether something is a genuine religious belief or not. Um, doing so 
is something the government's not competent to do, and its decisions amount to the, uh, a government effort to establish religion, because it's deciding what's religion and uh, what isn't. Uh, so one of the risks of the approach is, yes, you're open to uh, people making all kinds of fraudulent claims, but again, if lots of people are making those claims for whatever reason, they're saying we aren't going to serve you, then you say, well, this is a major impediment on these people's opportunities to participate in the market, and we can't allow that. Yeah. When we're talking about um, in ensuring people's access to different rights in the market, um, how do you think about the subtractability of, of, of kinds of goods, or like the rivalness for certain goods, meaning um, I think you kind of referenced Mill's book philosophy and rearticulating it from uh, live to and live and let live to live and help live. But what happens when my inclusion into a public good um, diminishes your piece of the pie too? You know, because then it, it it isn't that adding you isn't going to hurt me. It's that adding you reduces my ability to live as happily as, as, or as happily as I previously was. Does, am I, does that make sense? Uh, it does, although what you are saying um, uh, could be played out in several different ways. Uh, it might be uh, that uh, uh, we've got a set of material resources and if you get some, there's less for me. Uh, it might be uh, that um, uh, I feel your inclusion um, lessens my status somehow, even if not my material resources. Um, uh, and it may be uh, that I just feel an aversion to uh, having you on the same level as, uh, uh, same space as me, even if it's not uh, a question of loss of status um, uh, per se. Um, there are going to be clashing conceptions of uh, pursuits of happiness. Uh, and. Uh, uh, if people can only be made happy uh, by denying um, uh, pretty fundamental rights to other people, uh, then they lose. Uh, this is, again, the example of the, um, uh, uh, the teeth in the Lincoln uh, vision, uh, that um, uh, the mission is to secure basic rights as broadly as possible, and if my happiness is just bound up by denying you basic rights, um, that doesn't count. That's not a permissible pursuit of happiness because the mission is to provide basic rights for all. And so, yeah, I do feel that my, in that case, my pursuit of happiness uh, is being thwarted. Um, uh, but um, uh, this is a case where there's a clash um, that as you've defined it, you might not be able to resolve. If you can find a win-win solution, if it's material resources and we can both get more material resources and we're both happy, fine, that's what we should always do. Uh, but um, if it is true uh, that my happiness depends on your unhappiness, um, uh, then uh, the Declaration of Independent Projects, as I've defined it, and especially with this modified ethos, that doesn't count. Nope. Yep. So you mentioned in passing that much of this boils down to getting Congress back on track. Do you have any thoughts on how to get it into a mode of more constructive problem solving? Uh, well, one thing to do is, you know, the modern Congress uh, has adopted policies where they're uh, really only in Washington three days a week because they in session three days a week. Uh, because, and then they run back home um, and they raise money and they um, uh, campaign. Uh, so they don't spend a lot of time together working on the public's problems and trying to find common ground solutions. Uh, you could change the rules to restrict um, uh, time away from Washington and also um, uh, keep them in session more. And, um, uh, uh, you know, if they uh, uh, had to stay together and work on problems, they might do a little better. Might not, but that's one change. And uh, 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 Josh Chaffetz has a book on Congress that has a number of reforms, a, a law professor at Cornell who was a Yale undergraduate back in the day. So. Professor Smith, we form candidate selection. How? Uh, well, 
That's what these two have been writing about. It is true that we have a primary process now uh, in which uh, we tend to um, select more ideologically extreme candidates because those who are active in primaries um, and are more likely primary voters tend to be both more politically knowledgeable and engaged, but also more extreme. Um, and uh, in the past, we relied less heavily on primaries to choose candidates and did allow um, party officials uh, more of a role in selecting uh, candidates. Uh, it is, um, even though primaries began in the progressive era, they didn't become the pervasive pattern in American candidate selection until the last third of the 20th century. Um, and, uh, you know, for instance, uh, Ted White wrote uh, the book, The Making of the President, 1960, about um, Kennedy campaigning in primaries, but he campaigned in primaries in something like less than a third of the states, um, uh, because those were the only primaries they were, and, uh, uh, and that was a novelty then. Kennedy campaigned in the primaries only because people thought he couldn't be elected because he was a uh, Catholic, and he had to go out and win the primaries to show him. And his success, and Ted White's book's success, um, contributed to adopting presidential primaries much more extensively now, so that we, you know, uh, now you have to win the primaries. Uh, uh, but, you know, Hubert Humphrey got the nomination in 1968 uh, without running in the primaries. I didn't know that. Yeah, he didn't, he wasn't a declared, well, Johnson was running for a while, and he was his vice president, so he wasn't going to run. And then um, uh, uh, Johnson pulled out of the race, but Humphrey didn't get involved in the primaries. He got, uh, he, um, uh, he may have been on the ballot in a couple of the later primaries, but he wasn't in most of the primaries. And he got selected because uh, most of the delegates um, were um, uh, party leaders or under the control of party leaders. Um, uh, we may need a balance in which um, the uh, parties have more of a role in vetting candidates uh, to make the parties more a team working together rather than a uh, set of ideologues and divas, which is what we tend to get now. So, Rogers, could you, I, I find this very, there's a lot in this that's very appealing, um, but I'd like to get you to just talk a little bit more about the, the place of thinking about power in all of this, that, you know, you, you say, well, it, the, the accommodation should depend on how how many people are seeking a, a kind of accommodation. If it's only a few, we needn't worry. And so, so, sort of, so it's either the number or in relation to your answers here, it's just sort of like, you know, locks in. Everyone has a right to be part of the common and as long as they're not excluding others from the common. But I'm wondering why you don't go down because even some very small minorities can be extremely powerful and yeah. obnoxious. So why don't you want to go down the path of some sort of discrete and insular minorities type of constraint? Is it because you think it's a bad idea or you don't think it fits into the Lincoln story or both? I think that um, uh, the definition of discrete and insular uh, minority is not uh, flexible enough to provide for all the range of accommodations that you might need. Uh, are women a discrete and insular minority? Well, maybe in one sense, maybe not. You can, um, uh, uh, what about the disabled or the elderly or the young? Well, um, in some sense, they are um, uh, minorities, but are they discrete and insular? Yeah, well, so we don't have to use those, that exact phrase, but you don't seem to want to go down the idea of powerless or dominated or disadvantaged minorities or groups seeking accommodation from just any groups. And I, is it, you, you know, so I just wonder And uh, why. the main reason for that is to um, uh, uh, promote a sense of egalitarian inclusion, um, which you inevitably uh, uh, lose if uh, only certain groups uh, can get a hearing of a claim for special accommodation, whether it's granted or not. Um, but if they're not even allowed to be heard because they're uh, a privileged group in other respects, um, uh, you promote a sense of uh, in egalitarian inclusion if you take this approach. And you don't foster 
uh, this sense of uh, resentment and grievance uh, that is a uh, fire running through, a wildfire running through American politics now. Your minds sound pretty good to me. Yeah. One more, and then we need to let our professor <coughs> off the hook. Did you, you want it to come back? No. Um, I've kind of forgotten what it was now. <laughs> <laughs> you have another chance. You're going to dinner. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're going to get the last question. Yeah. This is this is a relation um, to 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 your two questions. It's like it's a typical attraction that Schlar also gets, or general accounts that focus on harm, which is something that you mentioned at the beginning, the problem of focusing too much on self-interest, so that you have too many people that say, oh yeah, you know, this is uh, here, uh, my kind of respect, I've heard it. Um, I feel disrespected. I have a claim here and there. So how do you make sure, and I didn't, like, you, ha you, you did say something about that there are not too many claims for accommodation. Right. But I wasn't really convinced by by that. And I see that now playing out also in Europe, specifically Eastern Germ Germany, where it's like, you know, if I get my if I get a better pension for my grandmother, then I don't want I want to use kind of the money for that rather than for the refugees coming in. So of course, you know, that's like then another question, which is like people or rights coming in from outside, because, you know, like in response to him, you said, well, the, the, the most important thing is to, to, make, to, to, keep, to keep the entire base together. Um, but there are like so many questions, right, when it comes to like what counts as what um, in relation to those like rights independent rights? Well, um, one of the challenges of this position is that it does require us to make um, continuing contextual judgments about um, trade-offs in our actual circumstances. And those judgments may change as circumstances uh, change. Um, and so, uh, you know, there may be times in which it doesn't particularly uh, hurt any of our other pursuits to uh, accept refugees or to redistribute funds to refugees, and there may be times uh, when it really does, and we can't achieve um, uh, other compelling purposes. Uh, so the policies do shift at different times, um, and uh, there isn't a clear, bright set of guidelines as to what the right answers are that apply uh, across different contexts and times. There's just uh, the same inquiry, uh, the same questioning about whether can I really um, pursue forms of satisfaction that um, uh, are uh, fulfilling to me while um, also helping others. Um, and we just, the quest is to try and give honest answers to those under our uh, current circumstances. Um, you may say, well, that's too uncertain, and uh, uh, in fact, there are different a jet answers in different places, or the same places at different times. All that's very unsatisfying, and um, it's so difficult to make those kinds of contextual judgments. But step back a minute. The way re the world really works is that we do make all those judgments all the time, and we do change them over time. I'm just calling for more self-conscious um, reflection on what we are actually doing. So, you know, if you say that's too hard, what you're really saying is, I want to keep doing it without thinking about it too much, which I don't think is a better guide forward. Amazing. I think we have to end you there. Have to end there. <laughs> My enduring disagreements with Rogers has been for decades. I have maintained that he's a political theorist, and he says, "No, I'm not. I'm a <laughs> public law person." But I, I rest my case. Thank you. <laughs>